What are the gaps and opportunities in climate information services? Yes, it is a big question and maybe I would need three days to cover all the topics. So today, I would like to narrow down to our stories and lessons learned from APEC climate centers, seasonal prediction, and sectoral application in the Pacific. And we'll try to set the compass for the next climate information services. And I am one more Kim from APEC Climate Center. So these are the contents. And first, where are we? Our current cl climate prediction systems are doing a great job, especially in the Pacific region, and they are still improving. Subseasonal forecasts are now proving their value in extended range. Climate information provides valuable advice to sectors, for example, agriculture, water management, infrastructure. But there's still something missing. There are still rooms to fill in. Here we would like to share our story of climate services, especially in the prediction services in the Pacific, and our attempt to utilize the state-of-the-art climate information to sectoral levels. I think from our success and failure, we would like to set the compass for the future climate information services. So where are we? I will focus on the climate prediction. So seasonal prediction provides useful information already a few months ahead. El Nino Southern Oscillation, for example, is now predictable several seasons ahead. And our prediction system has been improved a lot since the last two decades. And our dynamical system is mostly outperforming the statistical approach, as you can see in this bar graphs. The green, green ones are statistical system, and blues are the, our dynamical system. And it's bars bigger the better. And our systems are doing a good job. And we had a, a problem about spring, cold spring predictability barrier and slowly are overcoming that issue too. In terms of the sub-seasonal forecast, it's now proving its great potential. For example, Madame Julian oscillation, which is the major climate fluctuation in the tropical region in a sub-seasonal scale, is now predictable a month ahead. So these climate information climate prediction information as well as the climate projection information is feeding onto the sectoral application and are helping and aiding the uh, decision making for the sectors. So APEC Climate Center, as an APEC endorsed climate center, we are aiming to enhance the socio-economic well-being of member economies by utilizing up-to-date climate scientific knowledge and applying innovative climate prediction techniques through climate prediction, interdisciplinary research, climate information services, and inter international cooperation. And all of this information is freely available uh, to the member economies through our website or on request. So how about APEC Climate Center's current climate prediction system? We are our uh, multimodal ensemble dynamical seasonal prediction system is one of the world best thanks to the various model providers worldwide. So they run the dynamical models and we collect them together, make an ensemble forecast. And it is shown that uh, ensemble forecast has better skill than the individual contribution. As you can see in the temperature and precipitation forecast, the individual dots are individual contribution, and the red curve is our multimodal ensemble forecast system. And our ensemble forecast system uh, provides the optimized information for the global scale. And our system is gradually stabilizing and increasing its uh, skill. As you can see in the, this figure, the reddish purple colors of the recent period, and it is higher than the past five to 10 years ago. So our systems are improving, still improving, and the information is, has, shows the highest skill in the Pacific region, Indian Ocean, and some of the monsoon regions. 
not only the seasonal scale, but also the sub-seasonal scale, APCC is trying uh, to develop and testing a lot of uh, possibilities. And for example, the sub-seasonal forecast, we see that we have a great potential in the tropical region, South Asia, Australia, and South Pacific, especially in the dynamical variables. We are also testing and developing a tailored seasonal prediction system, for example, like Euro blocking prediction. And we see a promising result. And I already told you about the Madame Julian oscillation, which is the major uh, interest in climate variability. And APCC is operationally providing the summer version of this kind of interest seasonal oscillation, namely BCSO. And then it is uh, posted on the web page. So if these information are utilized, then you can actually make a medium range planning and adaptation uh, strategy. And also we are providing the subseasonal tropical cyclogenesis and for the targeted region and it is showing a good result. And the important thing is these information should be utilized in the sectoral levels and half of our scientists are in the application sector. So we try to integrate the climate information onto the sectoral level and for example we in a ground uh, water information systems. It is a one-stop solution for groundwater management. So we install the monitoring devices and then using the climate prediction information, we run the groundwater model so that those information can be applied to the sectoral level water management and planning. We expect those uh, action information can be used in a governmental level as well as in the uh, individual levels. But we have been working hard, but there were still some gaps and needs. So what are those? Let me just briefly summarize here. Climate projection information, climate seasonal prediction and sub-seasonal prediction, they, each sector has improved a lot for the last two decades. And in the application sector, we are trying to use those climate information. Each of the sector has its own progress, but its own gaps and needs. For example, in climate production, we are pretty sure about the global response, but people are asking, what about right here? What about the local response? But there are huge uncertainty, and we kind of have a poor understanding of the uncertainty. So that's another way we should work on. And in seasonal prediction, we have improved greatly in understanding of the major climate variabilities like El Nino Southern Oscillation and nonlinearity and surface processes. But there are demands on extremes forecast and types and flavor of those climate variabilities in an extended range. In terms of the seasonal prediction, the recent progress in Madame Julian oscillation, or BCSO, are remarkable. But there are still much to learn as a science, especially the land processes like snow and sea ice processes are just about the stage of coming into the operational level. So there is a still gap between academics and operations, so we need a lot of things to do there. But I think the most important part is the utilization of those information. So in a sector application, there has been weak multidisciplinary communication, which led to misunderstanding and loss of information. And that's why we need a seamless integration of seasonal and sub-seasonal prediction information into the sectoral levels. I think there are multiple different ways and different paths to take. And I think they are equally important, equally crucial. Maybe that's why we need, need an example to, example to learn from, example to follow. By the way, this is my boy. He's one year old. And before I came to the P PNG, he pointed out something. Dad, talk about the Pacific story. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be a good example for the climate services. So we would like to share some stories of our attempts in the Pacific, our attempts in the climate prediction services to the sectoral levels, 
so that we can set our own compass on pursuing the next stage of the climate information services. Because climate prediction data are not information unless they are utilized. And prediction skill is the highest in the tropical region, but the information is least utilized here. This is an example. It's our operational skill of climate prediction of sea surface temperature. And the purple color means almost perfect prediction. And as you can see, there are a lot of purples in the tropical ocean. And that's true all year round. So those information are pretty credible all year round, especially in the tropical Pacific region. But why then? Are they still suffering, or are we still suffering from severe weather events? Why are we still suffering from sub-seasonal events? Not only the sub-seasonal scale, but also the seasonal scale. Severe flood and multi-year drought are still an issue for the Pacific and for us. And also the climate change, sea level rise, ocean acidification, coral bleaching, ecosystem change is still threatening the livelihood of us, our people. Maybe the Pacific Islands as a group, maybe the planet's most vulnerable nations to the effect of climate change, with some already facing possible obliteration. And they are, and we are, vulnerable to all kinds of climate hazard, from subseasonal scale, seasonal, to climate change. So APEC Climate Center is providing services and developing together with the Pacific of the climate information. For example, tailored uh, seasonal outlook, Picasso, and applied climate information services. And through our pursuit, we have learned a lot. So today I would like to share some of the lessons learned from our pursuit so that we can set the compass. In terms of climate change, I think the Pacific is the pure victim of climate change because the population and the landmass of the Pacific is very tiny compared to the globe, globe and the greenhouse contribution is even smaller. It's like 0, 0.0 something percent. But eight out of 10 relatively highly exposed countries to cl climate change is in the Pacific, according to the APEC, uh, IPCC AR5 report. And the sea level rise is threatening the, their homes and their families. And many have already relocated. Just they are trying hard to protect their lives and homes from the nature, ironically, or nature, human-made nature, but it's not an easy job. Their histories, wealth of culture, and stories, as well as their future generations, are already in danger. But not only the climate change, but also the weather to sub-seasonal scale climate hazard are also important issue. For example, tropical cyclones. Cyclone Monica 2006, category five hit PNG, and Cyclone Pam 2015, another category five hit PNG and many other Pacific countries and territories. Cyclone Winston 2016 was the strongest tropical cyclone ever recorded in the Southern Hemisphere. And early this year, Cyclone Gita was the most intense tropical cyclone to impact Tonga. As you can see, many of them are after 2000s. And what is alarming is that we are projecting more severe Category 5 cyclones in a warmer climate, according to the IPCC report. Cyclone Winston claimed 42 lives in Fiji. It's the real lives of the real people. Cyclone Pam 2015 devastated the infrastructure 
and some are still suffering from the aftermath. And not only the sub-seasonal scale or weather scale climate hazard, but also the seasonal scale, severe multi-year drought, sometimes no water to drink, and severe flood, destructing the infrastructure, taking homes and lives. This is an example of uh, rainfall, monthly rainfall in Christmas Island, Kiribati, from 1996 to 1998. And the orange one was the La Nina year, and the blue one was the El Nino year. As you can see, during the La Nina year, there is almost zero rain throughout the years. So about two years multi-year drought happened, which was then quickly followed by Super El Nino in 1997 to 1998. And as you can see, the monthly rainfall reached almost about a, a, about a meter per month. That is a huge fluctuation, which is a big climate hazard. And that is partly because of the geographical location of the Pacific Island countries and territories. They are in the tropical to subtropical Pacific, which is typically influenced by El Nino Southern Oscillation and South Pacific Convergence Zone activity. So when there is a super El Nino or double dip La Nina, then multi-year drought or severe flood condition can happen. But the good news is that El Nino is predictable several seasons ahead. But the bad news is this information is not well spread into the sectoral level so that they can righteously prepare for the disaster. And also there are some demands on different flavor and evolution characteristics and locality of impact. But sparse monitoring system, as well as the lack of multi-sectoral impact analysis in the agricultural water, health, tourism sector, etc is hindering the progress of the preparedness. There are existing mechanisms and existing information services. For example, in climate prediction services, Scopic, the output product of the COSPET project performed by Australian, uh, they provide a pr statistical prediction, drought monitoring, data analysis tools. And it's kind of a masterpiece of statistical analysis and prediction tool. And APCC is providing a hybrid dynamical seasonal uh, statistical prediction system, Picasso, which is a tailored dynamical multimodal ensemble based prediction system at the station level. And these climate information are discussed and shared in a local uh, uh, mechanism and national mechanism like climate outlook forums. I think Philip today will uh, talk more details about these existing mechanisms. And APCC is also providing some uh, dynamically downscaled machine learning ba based drought monitoring system. So APIC Climate Center has been working with the Pacific for a few years and we have developed and um, working together with the Pacific uh, the tailored multimodal ensemble dynamical seasonal prediction system, which is Click P and Picasso, which is now uh, serviced by SPREP. And in terms of the sub seasonal scale, tropical cyclone prediction and drought mon monitoring system. And in a sectoral application of climate information, groundwater information services, and climate smart agriculture support the decision making in the sectoral levels. And we have recognized that it is very important for the resilient development, the multi-aspect approach is crucial. So we are working under the Green Climate Fund project for the climate information for sectors. And what was the most important thing was the sustainability. And we are focusing our capacity building for sustainability. For example, we are running a young scientist support program for the Pacific every two years. Let me go a little bit deeper onto the Picasso, uh, Pacific Island Countries Advanced Seasonal Outlook. It's a seasonal prediction system. So, using the current climate, we uh, model providers run the dynamical prediction, and APCC collects them together to make an ensemble forecast. 
And from that global forecast, we optimize information to the s uh, sectoral, uh, I mean, station level by statistical tailoring method. So it's a hybrid dynamical statistical seasonal prediction system. And Picasso is an accurate, tailored, and easy to use system so that you can very easily uh, access to the data. And in a, this is an example pages of Picasso. And in the outlook, you can get the perturbative probabilities of upcoming seasons prediction and its past skill so that you can assess how good was the skill so that you can give the information to the public. And if you are an expert, you can have more uh, access to the information in a detailed step. But what I want to highlight here is this interactive probability function. So if you are in a sector and your criterion is like 200 millimeter per month is a crucial value, then you put in your value, it gives you the uh, chance of higher than or lower than your own criteria va value. So those can be easily applied to the you know, sectoral levels. But what I think the beauty of Picasso we developed is the, it is not the system that only gives you the result. It doesn't only give you the number, it provides you how to interpret those information. Because losing information is critically Lead, lead to the misinterpretation in the sectoral level. So in the Picasso, we provide the global scale and regional scale outlook, and also provide the guide how to interpret you as a local expert to the public. And it also gives you the major climate driver information so that you can explain it uh, as a local expert to the public and the sectors. Also, you can manage your data privately and make your own Picasso. So, the prediction skill, maybe everybody's interested in the skill, is improved through our tailoring method. So, compared to the multimodal ensemble prediction skill, the Picasso's tailored skill has uh, improved. Black dots are the multimodal ensemble skill, and orange is Picasso, and bigger circle, the better the skill. So through our tailoring, the skill improves all year round, and all, you know, different El Nino uh, evolution stage. And the success rate is higher than our base multimodal ensemble system. And that's because dynamical systems often outperform the statistical method, and prediction skill is improved through our multimodal ensemble uh, technique. And then tailoring or post-processing can further enhance the skill. So there was a three-step enhancement of the skill. As a result, Picasso is now showing the best skill among the existing systems. And those accurate information is critical information for the you know, action and planning. So we are trying very hard to make uh, as accurate and as good information as possible. But why are we doing this? Yes, we are doing this to provide value-added, reliable, and real-time climate prediction information through interdisciplinary research and application, and distribute climate data, information products, and related tools as a climate center. But I think the core is building the user's own capacity. And capacity building is for the sustainability. If you just give you the give the product and never look back, then it just disappears. And capacity building for sustainability is that's the core of everything. And it involves the relevant target setting and also the transfer of ownership. So whenever a APCC does a project, we take this capacity building, target-oriented capacity building as core of our projects. And it should be very continuous to make it sustainable. So where should we go and how should we go? There are already existing visions and strategi strategies in every part of everywhere. For example, in the Pacific, the Pacific Island Meteorology Strategy, PIMS 
is foreseeing next 10 years. And they have clear priorities and clear key outcomes and key outputs. It is very important to align with their visions and strategy. And there are still remaining needs and demands. For example, Pacific Med Council's Honey Hour statement last year states that it requested user-friendly integrated approach and capacity building and training of the med services and supporting decision making in sectors. So APCC is in alliance with those visions and projects uh, in needs and demands. We are making a consensus forecast system, which has a cute name, COCO. It's a simple and user-friendly method. And try to re increase the capacity building through various training and workshop program. It is performed not only by us, but with our friends in the Pacific, like SPREP, and trying to make a customized forecast for the sectoral levels, for sectoral application of climate information. But when we are doing this, APCC, it is not for APCC, but it is for the Pacific. So it has to be need driven. We don't want to do it because we want to do it. We do it because it is needed. It has to be relevant. It has to, we have to do it for greater good. It has to address the people's real need. And when we do it, and when you do it, it has to be excellent. We have to do something meaningful. Maybe it is really hard to find the balance between appropriate technology and cutting edge science, but what I'm telling you is one plus one is bigger than two. And we have to work together and coordinate, and we don't have to duplicate and align with the existing mechanism. And most importantly, sustainability is the core, because in the end, user owns it, and it has to be understood, utilized, operated, and maintained by the users if it, has, it wants to be successful. After all, it's not for them, it's for us an, as an APEC, as a global citizen. So the point is, I think there are multiple different ways and different paths, and they are equally important and equally crucial. But it has to be, in terms of the uh, climate information services, it has to be need driven. And it has to be excellent. And we have to work together with the existing mechanism. And the core is the sustainability. So whatever you do in your own field, what I want to say and conclude is that it has to be need driven excellent and work together for the sustainability in whatever field you do.